this talk on the subject, Is Jesus God? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما المسيح ابن مريم إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل وأمه صديقة كان يأكلان الطعام انظر كيف نبين لهم الآيات ثم انظر أن يفلحون صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and brother, people naturally become inquisitive. They would like to know how does it come about that a Muslim is expounding biblical prophecies, is dealing with Islamic subjects from the Christian point of view, that, might, that he might be able to appeal to the Christians. Where did he get this knowledge from? I did make some indication in the beginning of my lecture tour that I was working in a country shop and across the shop from where I was there was a Christian mission, Adam's Mission Station, where missionaries were being trained. And these missionaries were coming into the shop where I was working, selling sugar and salt, handkerchief, flour. This was my work. And me and my other, there were other young uh, ex-students just left school. We were being hammered by the Christians. They came along, whatever they studied, they practiced it on us. He so, said, you know, Islam was spread at the point of the sword. In other words, Muhammad forced his religion down people's throat by threatening them of chopping of their heads. He said, Muhammad copied his book. The Quran from the Jews and the Christians. You know, he had so many wives and on and on. We were at the receiving end of a Christian assault, attack. And either I felt you should leave the job and run away or defend yourself. But you can't defend yourself if you have no knowledge. And I was in desperation. And Allah Baritala is Musabibul Asbab, He is the creator of opportunities. I was restless one Sunday morning, didn't know what to do. I want some reading material. There was no books to read, but I was hungry to read. So I go into my boss's warehouse, rummaging through a pile of newspapers, looking for something pleasant to read, like the Farmer's Weekly and things of that nature. And in that pile of newspapers, I come across a worm-eaten book full of mildew. And the name of that book was Izharul Haq, which means the truth revealed. At the end of this booklet, if you have received it, is the Bible God's word. There is an epilogue that how these things happen. And I mention here that this book, Izharul Haq, changed my life, my, all my experiences. You know, it has made me actually, that one book made me to come here now. And you coming to listen to me because of that one book. What one book can do? So in that book, it was written by an Arab, and this Arab gentleman was trying to arm the Indian Muslims, who were at that time at the receiving end of a Christian assault in India. You see, India was in the hands of the Muslims. They were ruling it. They ruled it almost a thousand years. And the British came with the superior gun power, and they snatched power, dominion, rule out of our hands. And they felt, and they thought rightly, that if at any time anybody would give them trouble, it would be the Muslims. Because they had tasted power, tasted dominion, tasted rule. And once you have tasted it, you aspire to get it once more back again. So they said, if we can convert these people, if we can make them to turn the other cheek, you know, we can rule India for a thousand years. So they started pouring in the missionaries, like frogs in the rainy season into India. And they started mastering our language and wanting to debate with the Muslims. At first, the Muslims were reluctant. You know, these are the, our rulers now. They have conquered us. And if we debate with them, you know, they might put us in jail, rob an island, something like that. 
So he says, man, leave it out. But now since they started learning our language and challenging us in our mother tongue, the Muslims were forced to accept the challenge. And Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, this is I'm reading in the book, which made everything interesting to me, which brought me here. That Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, he was forced to accept the challenge. It was a certain reverend founder who was the head of that movement, missionary movement. And according to the appointed time and date, the debate started. The reverend started the debate with requesting the Maulana. Maulana means our sheikh or imam in our language, you see, in the language of the Indian Muslim. He said, Maulana Sahib, telling him in Urdu, Sir, respected Maulana, get started. Start the ball rolling. So the Maulana said, you see, look, you are our elder brother. In other words, Christianity precedes Islam by 600 years. So you are 600 years senior to us. So as such, you have the first preference. Number two, he said, look, you are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but a guest at that. So as such, again, you have the first preference. So the reverend was forced to start the debate. And he started with a question. This is Maulana Sahib, speaking in Urdu. Maulana Sahib, where is your Prophet Muhammad now? So the Maulana, after a pause, he replied that he is in Jannatul Firdaus, in heaven, blessed heaven with God Almighty. Out of that answer came the second question. He said, all right, all right. Tell me now, where was he when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala? So the Maulana again thought for a moment and he again replied, he was still in Jannatul Firdaus, in blessed heaven with God Almighty. Out of that answer came the third question. I'm reading this in the book. He said, all right. Now, Maulana Sahib, look, if you, as if your Muhammad was with his Allah, as you say, and while his grandson was being butchered, the shaheed at Karbala, didn't he ask his Allah for help? He said, look, my grandson is being butchered, please. Have mercy on him, save him. So there was a long pause. And the reverend couldn't hold his peace. He started stamping his feet. Come on, come on. Did you, didn't he? Didn't he ask his Allah for help? Because if somebody is bullying me, and if I have a young heavyweight champion next to me, I say, look, man, Akhi, please, man. you know, yes, yes, help me, save me. So didn't he ask his Allah for help? So after a long pause, the Maulana said, yes, he did. He did. So what did he say? We know he wasn't saved. What did Allah say? And there was an inordinate pause, undue pause. So the reverend again started stamping, come on, come on, what did he say? So the Maulana said, Allah cried, he cried. So what? Allah cried? He said, yes, he said, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> and the debate was over. I hope the chairman doesn't take exception to your laughter. Look. We are human beings. We must have sense of humor. Sense of humor is not only laughing at other people, but we can also laugh at ourselves. There are times, and I know you have it. I, was, I remember in the city hall, Cape Town, I made a joke against the Malays. And the Malays, they enjoyed it. It was against them. I said, look, they have a sense of humor. They can also laugh at themselves. This is greatness. Laughing at other people, any fool can do that. But can you laugh at yourself? Sometimes the joke is on us. We must be able to laugh it. Don't lose your temples. I am reading another anecdote. You see, what made me to read that book? It says there was an Arab sheikh. Arab sheikh. And a Christian missionary, you know, got stuck into him. And they have that perseverance. Look, we must give them that credit. You know, they can come night after night. And you can knock them, daze them, you know, with all the arguments. And still they come back for more. <laughs> they have it. Look, we haven't got it. Admit it. We haven't got that quality. We can't take it. <laughs> they can take it. Wallah, they can take it. 
So this this missionary, he kept on going to this Arab Sheikh, you know, day in and day out. He says, preaching to him, Christ crucified, that, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Jesus Christ died for your sins. They will only accept and you'll be saved. And he won't let go. Perseverance. Perseverance was there. So the Arab Sheikh told his secretary, he said, look, when this guy comes again next time, I want you to come and whisper something in my ears. So according to the arrangement, when the missionary started again, Christ died for your sins, Christ crucified. So this secretary of his comes along and whispers something in his ears. And he started <laughs> crying. Something as if somebody's dead. So the missionary naturally went to what has happened? So I just got the sad news that Jibreel died. <laughs> the archangel Gabriel, that he died. So don't be a fool. So angels don't die. And says, you fool, you're telling me all along that God died. <laughs> angels don't die, but God can die. So, we want to know whether he was God. The subject is, is Jesus God? If he died, did he die as a man? We know he didn't die. We are told, Wama kataluhu, Wama salabuhu. They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. But let us accept their word for whatever they say. He said, now look, when he died, did he die as a man or did he die as a God? If he died as a man, useless. Wallah, the whole, whole theology is useless. Because one man can't carry the sins of the whole world. One man can't. He must die as a God. If he dies, if he is crucified, he must be crucified as a God. Only then he can redeem mankind. So they must tell us, did he die as a man or did he die as a God? So if he dies as a God, then God died. Tell us what? Now this question, is Jesus God? can be answered very easily by asking a counter question. You see, to the question, is Jesus God? We ask a counter question, did he claim to be God? If he claimed to be God, then we start discussing further. What is the implication of that statement? First, did he claim such a thing? You see, there are people today in the world, like in India, they say Mahatma Gandhi, you heard his name, I'm sure, Mahatma Gandhi. He was the ninth incarnation of God. You see, the Hindus believe in God's incarnates, meaning God coming down to earth again and again as a man. They say when the need arises, you see, God Almighty, he comes down to earth, he delivers, delivers the message and he dies, somebody kills him and he dies, and when the need arises again, he comes again. This is the Hindu theology, you see. In that system of incarnation, they believe Rama was the seventh incarnation of God, Krishna was the eighth incarnation of God, means eight times that God came into the world, he came in the form of Krishna, Buddha was the ninth incarnation of God, Kalanka Avatar was the tenth, and Mahatma Gandhi was the eleventh. I'm sorry, I said ninth. He was the eleventh, according to certain Hindu theologians. Now, we have to ask our Hindu cousins, did Mahatma Gandhi say that? He says, no. He says, don't waste time. Look, simple, easy. If 600 million Hindus say Mahatma Gandhi is the 11th God incarnate, we ask them, did Mahatma Gandhi say that? This is no. They say, look, throw it to the wall, wasting time. Don't waste time, don't waste your breath, no more. 90 million Germans, they go once more, on the war path. This time they say Hitler was the second God incarnate. Jesus Christ was first, Hitler is number two. We asked the Germans, did Hitler say that? They said, no. He said, God, please, don't waste our time. This is hot air. You know, something gone wrong with you. The same thing, Rama. He said, Reven Rama is the seventh. Did Rama say that? He says, no. Throw it to the wall. If somebody said the Holy Prophet Muhammad was God incarnate, ask that fool. Did Muhammad say that? He says, no. He says, shit. For sake. <laughs> Look, simple, easy. First thing, the man makes a claim. Now we analyze that claim. 
But if the man didn't make the claim, there's no sense in wasting your breath. So to the question, is Jesus God, we pose a counter question, did he claim to be God? And on the first night of my, this series of talks, there was one of our Christian brethren. He came forward and it had no connection with the lecture. He had to make a statement that Jesus Christ is God. He had to come and make that statement. In other words, in his mind, heart and mind, he delivered the message to the Muslims. Now you all will go to hell if you don't accept him. He's done his duty. So I responded, I said, look man, there is not a single unequivocal statement anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. Meaning a single statement, straightforward, saying that, look, I'm God. No doubt about that. If a man says, I'm God, or he says, worship me. I said, show me in your book. 73 books of the Roman Catholics or 66 of the Protestants anywhere in any version and they have a thousand versions now day by day they're coming out you know, it's like mushrooms they're spouting I went to the Bible house this afternoon and I was pleased with the amount of Bibles they have versions that they have I had to buy one because one of our Christian interrogators you know questioners when I asked him what Bible have you got he doesn't want to answer he wants to know what Quran have you got so I said, it is Abdullah Yusuf Ali. I said, what Bible have you got? So he says, NIB. Never heard it in my life before. I'm supposed to be in the know. Oh, maybe now I think he must have said NIV, but it sounded like NIB, Nib. I said, Nib, NIB? What Bible is that? So it's a new international version. I said, oh. So I had to go and buy one. I bought one today. So now he can come forward and I can speak to him about the NIB. You see, now this is how knowledge increases. The guy puts a problem to you, he comes around with something new, so let's go and see this new thing now. Where did these guys get their information from? I want the guys to come forward and ask me now about the NIB, and I'll tell him something about the NIB. Then you want to know, where does he know about NIB? I said, look, these guys are my friends. You see, everybody who comes to question you, anything difficult, he is your best friend, though you don't like it for the moment. We don't like it. You know, a Greek philosopher, he said, if you want a man to hate you, Make him think. Make him think. If, because we don't like to think. <laughs> One of our brothers is smoking cigarette, please put it off. Uh, doesn't be fit our meeting, please. Put off your cigarette. In 1840, Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, he was delivering a series of talks and in that series of talks, he spoke about our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the hero prophet. And his introduction to his lecture, he starts. He says, in the history of the world, there will not again be any man ever so great whom his fellow men will call a god. Never again. In other words, mankind has reached that state of intellectual development that he will not accept another human being as god anymore. This is what he said. This is what he thought, but he was wrong. You see, we have reached a stage, for example, now me, me, look at me. If I can fly like a bird in this hall and come back and stand here again, you know it's impossible. Nothing there, no, no gears or anything like that. No jets, propulsion, nothing. And you see me, I can fly like a bird. I can read your mind. I can tell you what you got in your pocket. Will you accept me as a God? Will you? No. Why not? I said, look, your father can't do that. I can give life to the dead. I can fly like a bird. I can walk on the water. Believe that I'm God. He said, look, man, while we are looking at you, we can see so many things. You are about 66 years old. Over 60 in any case. And you won't be here for another 60. Definitely. <laughs> right? He says, you know, <laughs> each one of us can strangle you quite easily. If you are a knife, we can knife you. So we can see, man, look, how you do these things, I don't know. We don't understand, uncle, how you do it. But I know you're not by God. Because before 66, you were not here. And this universe is here for billions of years. You know, you didn't make your father. You didn't make your grandfather, did you? He says, no. He says, look, you're not God. Simple, easy. Now, man, what I do? You say, man, you, I'm terrified of you. If you can do these things, I know you might have certain powers, you might kill me. But I says, you're not my God. I can see that. You're eating food? I know if you don't get food, 
in time you're going to die. If you don't have water, you'll dehydrate. I know that. So you're not my God. Simple, easy. Then how did it happen? He's posing the question, Thomas Carlyle. How did it happen that people have conferred divinity upon other human beings? He says, nay, we may rationally ask, did any set of human beings ever really think that the man they saw there, standing beside them, a god, the maker of this universe? Ask yourself the question. That the contemporaries of Rama, did they think Rama was a god? Because Ravan, the king of Ceylon, he abducted his wife. Did he think he was abducting his god's wife? No. If he thought he was his god, he'll never abduct his wife. He stole his wife and kept her for 12 years. God's wife? No, he, he was another guy, man. See, beautiful woman, an Aryan woman, and this guy was a Darvidian, a dark-skinned fellow. He loved this woman, and he played a trick and he abducted her. He was not abducting the wife of his god. Simple logic. Krishna, the Pandavas were having it out with him again and again. Were they thinking they were fighting a god? The answer is no. If they thought Krishna was a god, they never would have gone into battle against him. Can you see? Jesus Christ. He says, you know, the Bible says in the Gospel of St. Luke, I think chapter 2, verse 23, I know the Christians are very funny, it might be 323. You see, it says, will come along and on say, point of order, correction. Mr. Dida doesn't know. It is chapter 2, not chapter 3. I said, look, I'm not infallible, and I'm also old, you know, I can't remember all the figures so well. However, chapter 2, verse 23. It says, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. I'm only reading what's written there. When he was eight days old, he was circumcised, and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. So asking, who was in his mother's womb? They said, Jesus. So who is Jesus? He's God and the Son of God. Veritable Son of God. So how did he come out from there? It's just like you and me. I'm asking, please explain. In Zulu, it's a chasel, a chasel. You know, make it easy for me. How? How? Please explain. And you watch his face. How can you explain? And he was circumcised. I said, the barber. It was a barber's job. There were no surgeons those days to circumcise children. The barber did the job. You see, this was their privilege. So a barber comes along to the stable after eight days, and you know how circumcision takes place. I remember because I was eight years old when I was circumcised. So I know very vividly how things happen. You see. When children are eight days old, they know nothing was going on. But I says, I know how it works. Imagine God being circumcised. You can imagine somebody coming and holding God and saying, this is my God and circumcising him. No. Did the barber think he was a god? No. Did his teacher, when he went to school, did he think he was teaching a god? No. When the Roman soldier punched him in the stomach, he says, come on, professor, who hit you? Did he think he was punching his god? No. When a soldier lanced him on the side with a spear, did he think he was lancing his god? No. Look. Simple. The contemporaries of the person concerned, did they think the man was a god? The answer is no. Then how did it happen? We are brainwashed, program. Jeffrey Hunter, you know, he acted in the film called King of Kings. And in that film, he had to play the part of going on Mount Zion, outside Jerusalem. He had to climb. And while he was climbing, he's sweating. He's panting for breath. You know, to, for the filming, he had to go up. There were no helicopters to take him then, you see, so he had to go up. So he says, Christian, born Christian. He said, for the first time in my life, I realized how human Jesus was. <laughs> he must have gone through the same process. You know, sweating, panting for breath. But we imagine today, the Christian imagines that he was like a spirit moving one minute here, one minute there. Like look, our brother said, I was in the Middle East. And I tell you, yes. If I tell you in five countries in so many days, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I was in Durban, I'm in, John, uh, in, in Cape Town, now you'll find me in Johannesburg, and I'm going to Botswana, I'm going to Sudan. I'm go but you know I have to work hard to get these places. I'm not floating like a spirit. You see, I have to go and catch the plane, I have to wake up in time. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's all difficult. But now, when people tell you, say, you know, he was there, and I saw him there, and then when I went to Cape Town, I saw him there lecturing there. So you think he was a ghost. 
Jesus was a ghost. But you know, Jesus is no ghost. Now, Allah Baritala absorbs Hazrat Isa al Islam from any type of association that he claimed to be God. On the Day of Judgment, Allah Baritala will question according to Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 119 and 120. It reads, it says, And behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, didst thou say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of God? He will say, Jesus will say, Glory be to thee. Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, thou wouldst indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my heart, though I know not what is in thine. For thou knowest in full all that is hidden. Justification that Hazrat Isa a.s. never claimed to be God. Because of that, I am able to offer to my, our Christian brethren, you show me one place in any version of your Bible where Jesus says, I am God, I am prepared to accept him. You show me anywhere in the Bible, Jesus says, worship me, I say, I am prepared to worship him. I say, I don't talk for my brethren, I don't talk for you, I talk for myself. I put my neck on the guillotine, chop it up as you like, show me. Why can I make such a claim, such an offer? Because I know there is no such thing. If there was any doubt, <laughs> look, I love my life. We all do. So I know there isn't. So I said, show me one place in your book, any version of any Bible, where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. I said, I'm prepared to do that. There isn't such a thing. There's some note here, let me read it. So I would like those standing to come to the stage. Could we have a short pause? Thank you very much. Those of our brethren, please, you know, do come in. Allow our brethren outside to take your place. Come right in, take come on the stage. I know. Yes. Ladies, find any gentleman sitting at the back, tap him on the shoulder, you know, you'll know what you want. You need his seat. Those in the doorway, you may like to stand there all night, but there are other people in the foyer who would like to come inside. So would you please come up to the stage? It is the last time we are going to break to give people the chance to come up to the stage. You need not be afraid, you won't have to answer any of the questions. Last request, please come to the stage. Those gentlemen who are sitting, please offer your seats to the older folk and to the ladies. Please. Can even sit in the aisles if you do not want wish to come to the stage. If that is all, then we will be compelled to continue. Thank you for the break, sir. Mr. Chairman and brethren, leave out claiming divinity the man, Jesus Christ, was so humble. He did not want people even to call him good. Leave out being called God. He didn't want people to call him good master. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 19, verse 16, I'm reading. And behold, one came and said unto him, to Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do? that I may have eternal life. He's asking question, what must I do to get Jannah, heaven? Verse 17, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? What are you calling me good for? There is none good except one, that is God. He is the only one who deserves to be called good. Don't call me even good. But, 
If thou wilt enter into life, means if you want life eternal, if you want Jannah, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Means whatever was taught to you, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. So whatever you were told to do, keep the commandments. I'm asking my Christian brethren that if I was that Jew, and this is the answer I got, so I said, right, Alhamdulillah. I'm trying to, inshallah, I will not commit adultery, I will not steal, I will not kill. Will I enter Jannah or not? This is the master says, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. That's all. So I said, look, all right, alhamdulillah. If that is all that is required, like somebody, you go and ask some alim. He said, look, what must I do to go to Jannah? He said, look, you keep on praying five times a day. Right? If you think that he's authorized to tell you that, so Jannah is for you. You keep on praying five times a day, Jannah is for you. Jesus says, keep the commandments. I said, right, I keep the commandments. There was no question of anybody dying for anybody's sins. Keep the commandments. Follow laws and commandments of God. And don't call me good. There's only one good. That is God. But the Christians, you know, they are going to the extremes. You read the literature. Or when they confront you, these born again, they will tell you, they want to corner you into this place. Either, they say, they use the word either. Last night, I don't know, the night before, in the city hall, I was using the word either. Either this or that. Either this or that. They're giving you alternative. So, either way you get caught. So, either Jesus is God or a liar. This is Christian literature. They will ask you, so look, either Jesus is God or he's a liar. Can any Muslim say he was a liar? No. So, he must be God. I'm asking, is the word liar, is it an opposite of the word God? Is that an antonym of God in any language? The opposite word for God, is it a liar? No. But now you see, they put it to you in a corner, and now you as, a, we as Muslims, we can't say he was a true messenger of God. We know he would never lie. That's why I say, if he said he's God, then he must be God. I'm prepared to accept it. Show me where. The Quran says he didn't make such a claim, and the Bible says the same. He never made any such claim. Either another. Either Jesus is God or a lunatic. I say, when is lunacy, lunatic, an opposite of God? So, are you, any Muslim, can you say Jesus was a lunatic? No. So you are caught. So you must say he's God. Or, another thing, either Jesus is God or an imposter. Look at this. Either this or that. Why should they be, they say, this man here is either black or white. But between black and white, there are endless shades of gray. We know that. Among us, look at us. Endless shades, you know, we are. <laughs> Why must it be, he must be black or he must be white? This hat I'm wearing is either white or black. Couldn't I be wearing a gray one? Or a red one? Or a pink one? Why must it be this or that? But this is the type of sickness. You see, they have developed a sickness. So Allah says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ Whosoever says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, they are making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy. It's a treason against Allah. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ But Christ said, يَا بَنِ إِسْرَعِيلُ O children of Israel, O Jews, لَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ Worship Allah. Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. In the whom you shirk Allah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, فَكَدَ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِلْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannah haram for them, no heaven for them. وَمَعْوَهُ النَّارِ And the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. وَمَعْلِ الظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the wrongdoers there will be no one to help. Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 75. Now, you come across these people in the flesh, learned people. And i give you an experience of mine. We had a Reverend Dr. Morris, the head of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. He was brought over by the Department of Information. You see, our government is bringing VIPs, the very important people from all over the world. And they, at their expense, government expense. And they look after them, they feed them, and they take them around, show them your Belleville University. They said, look at this, what we have done for the colored people. Have you got one like this in your country? For the blacks? 
He says, no. Take them to Durban Westville. It's a monumental building. He said, you see this? This is what we have done for the Indians. Look at it. Have you got one like that in your country? He says, no. He takes him to the University of Zululand. Masterpieces. University of the North. Masterpieces of construction. Millions they spent. Our government. Show them around. Let's look at Soweto. One million people we have housed. We know it's not perfect. Look, we are not perfect. Rome was not built in a day. Give us a little break. You know, things will come right. Now, when these guys, when they go back, they will go back telling the people, say, look, South Africa is not as bad as what people make it out to be. And if a person can say that, our government is happy. Just that is not as bad as people say. So Reverend Morris comes along, Department of Information, they give me a ring. He was a man of religion. So he was to be brought to the masjid, the Juma Masjid Durban. It's also a, a landmark in Durban. It's the largest mosque south of the equator. On Fridays we get 4,000, a congregation of 4,000 musallis. 4,000 on Fridays. And it's right in the center of the city. The architecture is Mughal architecture. So they phoned me and said, look, we have Reverend Dr. Morris. And he's coming on a certain day. Will you be prepared to take him around and explain to him what goes on? Oh, this is a privilege for us. So I, Reverend Dr. Morris, his wife, and a lady from the Department of Information, they came on Juma day, and I explained to them what happens. And then since it was lunchtime, I said, look, uh, if you don't mind, you know, I can take you all for lunch. So he's looking at the lady of the Department of Information, says, we have no lunch appointment. She says, no. I said, no. Come. So I take them to the Golden Peacock. It's in Durban. Not in Iran. Yeah, in Durban. Golden Peacock. <laughs> so I order four biryanis. You know what biryani is. That's one of our most delicious dishes. And we sit down and we start chatting about God and about religion. And Mrs. Morris is staring at me. And I says, what is this you two, you know, carrying on? So I said, Madam, what do you expect us to do? You see, when two hairdressers meet, they talk about hairstyles. When the shoemakers meet, they talk about shoes. When men of religion meet, they talk about God. Naturally. But to the reverend, I'm suggesting to him, I says, you know, we Muslims, we believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We know, we believe that he was the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. He says, we are going together. I said, the only real point of difference between us is that we say he's not God and he's not his son. Not the begotten son of God. Metaphorically, we are all his children. The good and the bad. But physically, God does not beget. So our only point of real difference between the Muslim and the Christian is that we say Jesus is not God and you say he is God. And I said, for that, you have no authority. There is nowhere in the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. The same, same, same. I said, there is nowhere in the Bible where he says that I and God Almighty are one and the same thing. So when I said that, the last phrase, that I, Jesus, and God Almighty are one and the same thing. It tickled his memory. This is a human behavior. This is how memories get tickled. You know, some word is used, which you already have something like that uh, in your mind, and this word tickles the other one. So when I said, no way, where he says, him and God Almighty are one and the same thing. So. He had been reading the Bible. He is a reverend, D.D., Doctor of Divinity. So he said, no, there is. I said, what? He said, Jesus did say, I and my father are one. I said, yes. Yes, he did say that. That I, that's Jesus, and father means God, are one. So I'm asking him, what is the context? So he's staring at me. I said, you know, what you quoted is the text. John chapter 10 verse 30. That is the text. I would like you to give me the context, the text that goes with it before or after. So he's staring at me. The biryani is waiting. <laughs> so he's asking me, you know, usually it happens. I, it happened in the city hall Cape Town. When I asked, what is the context, a preacher 
of the DRC, he had the Bible under his arm, he started open. I say, put that Bible away. You quoting a verse, surely you know what you're talking about, in what sense it was used. What are you opening the book for? And you claiming you've got the spirit in you. So before it was out with you, now it's in you. I said, let the spirit speak now. No, the spirit deserts them. Without the book, utterly helpless by God, I tell you. You saw last night. Something. They must, they prepare at home, make notes. They bring somebody's magazine. That is all that they're asking. I said, look, one and a half hour, what were you listening? Not one question. What homework they did at home, they bring that here. The night before, same. In the city hall, same. They bring what they write at home, they bring it. I said, one and a half hour, you're listening. What are you listening? Where is this Holy Ghost? Why is it deserting you people? Come out with it. Doesn't the Holy Ghost help you to think or to remember? Nothing. Put on and you watch. As soon as they say, put the book away. Talk. I want you to talk to me. And you see, finish. You punctured him. You punctured the guy. As say, put the book down and talk. You are a professional. This is your job. Why can't you talk and tell me what you have to offer? Talk. I don't want you to start reading things to me. Encyclopedias. So he said, do you know the context? I said, of course I know the context. So what is the context? He's asking me. He is a DD. <laughs> I was a D dad. <laughs> So I said, start, John chapter 10, verse 23. It reads, I'm reading from memory, you know. Even though we don't claim it, it looks like we have got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and Jesus walked in Solomon's porch, meaning in the temple of Jerusalem. The man is alone. You know, he has been condemning these Jews. According to the scriptures, using vitriolic language, you generation of wipers, you whited sepulchres, you hypocrites. You wicked and adulterous generation. When you talk like that, somebody's got it in for you. And the Jews are not the people who will forgive you in a hurry. So he's alone. So they... The man is walking alone, so they go up to him. Then came the Jews. Round about him and surrounded him. And said, How long does thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. You know, brandishing a finger in his face. You know, wanting to start a fight. This is not asking question. Actually, they want to pick up a fight. He said, look, you know, the way he has been condemning, maybe he's talking about that. He said, but now we give him a good bashing. He's alone. Fix him up. Slot him. Give it to him. He said, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly, man. That means you're talking ambiguously. Why don't you put your claim clear enough that you are the Messiah we're waiting for? Verse 25. So Jesus answered them. He said, I told you. I told you. And ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they be witness of me. Verse 26. But ye believe not. Ye are not of my sheep, my followers. You are not my followers. As I said unto you. 27. My sheep hear my voice. In my followers, they listen to me. And I know them and they follow me. Verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Neither shall any man, once a man, people have accepted faith, I will see to it that the man remains in faith. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse 28. Nobody will pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29, neither shall any man pluck them out of the, of the Father's hand, God's hand. I and my Father are one. In this, to see that once the man has accepted faith, God sees to it that the man remains in faith, and I as a prophet of God see to it that he remains in faith. We are one in this, to see the man remains in faith. He's not talking about his omnipotence, his omniscience. That you know what God can do, I can do. No. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. That's what he said about himself. This is, he's talking about, in purpose, they are one. God Almighty, what he wants to do? Jesus Christ. He's on that same wavelength. He vibrates whatever God tells him to do, he does. 
both see to it that the man is kept in Iman, faith. As a way, does he say that he is equal to God? He is God. Or he is made of the same substance, same nature, same omnipotence, same power. Where? But the Jews were looking for trouble, so they picked up stones again to stone him. That's what the Bible says. Because they were looking for trouble. And when you're looking for trouble, they say you get it around the corner. You don't have to go very far. So Jesus answered them. See? They picked up stones again to stone him. So he said, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works will you stone me? So they say, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, kufar. Because that thou being a man, makest thyself a god. You are a human being, you know, and you say you are a god. Now, this is a second allegation. The first allegation was that he's talking ambiguously, not clear enough. So why don't you tell us plainly that you are our Messiah? That's one charge. Is it true or false? So the Christmas is false. Because he says, no, Jesus did make his claim. It's all right. So he was talking, this is a false charge against Jesus. That is talking ambiguously, not plainly. He says it's a false charge. Now they make a second charge. You are claiming to be God. Now, the Jews said the man is claiming to be God. The Christians say that he was entitled to be called God because he was God. We want to know what does Jesus say. See, the charge is made against him. Let him answer. So he says, is it not written in your law? The Hebrew word for law is Torah in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the first five books attributed to Moses. He says, is it not written in your law? He's sarcastic. It's also his law. But because now they are prodding him, he's sarcastically telling them, say, is it not written in your law? Like, you know, in my Quran, I know it says, Wala thalasa. Don't say Trinity. Then you, a Muslim, you're arguing with me. That, you know, it could be, you know, some way we can justify it as, hey, is it not written in your Quran? Wala takulu salasa. Oh, this is my Quran. I'm charging you because, look, man, the Quran that you have at home, unless you have a different one to the one that we are using. Can you see? It? So he said, is it not written in your law? I said, he is quoting, ye are gods. He is quoting from the 82nd Psalm in the Old Testament, in the Bible. He is quoting. Verse number 6, where it says, I have said, God Almighty is talking, supposed to be. He said, I have said, ye are gods. Means all of you are gods. All of you, the Jews, all you Jews are gods. This is there in every Bible. The Nip Bible, or the Bib Bible, or the Rip Bible, any Bible is there. What I'm quoting, it says, is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are gods. If he, that's God Almighty, called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, in the prophets are called gods in our language, man. And you find no fault with that. This is the genius of our language. Like you have a genius in your language, the Afrikaners here. You know, the first time when I went to uh, somewhere around Adderley Street, I wanted to go to the toilet. <laughs> so I go to the toilet, it says there, Dharma. Dharma and hearer. So now this word hearer, I was learning Afrikaans verses from the Bible in Afrikaans. This is ek, ek is the hearer, and that is khin heilan beten meni. I say ek, ek is the hearer from the book of Isaiah I'm quoting. Ek, that I am God, and there is no savior besides me. Ek, ek is the hearer. H-E-R-E. And that is khin heilan beten meni. So I said hearer? Means God. They have toilets for gods in Cape Town. I didn't. No, you see, this is the genius of your language. You can use it for God, here, it is the here, and then you also use it for gentlemen. Right? That's the genius of your language. So Jesus is telling them, is it not written in your law that this word God is used for prophets? And reference in the Old Testament, the Lord said unto Moses, Exodus, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. 
से सी आई हैव मेड दी ए गॉड टू फेरो चलिए हजरत मूसा सलाम दैट आई हैव मेड यू ए गॉड टू फेरो एंड आर ऑन दाई ब्रदर शेल बी दाई प्रॉफिट so this is the genius of the jewish language they didn't mean that musa alaihi salam is god no jews said that he was god but the bible says god made him a god he is a god to pharaoh what it means is this that you are going to pharaoh instead of me so when he says food sack to you he's telling food sack to me this is what it means you are my representative you are like a god when he denies you he's denying me when he disrespects you he's disrespecting me like an ordinary policeman comes along he says mr did you are wanted I know, so I've done some karate in my time, you know. <laughs> But you know what it implies. Ah, the guy's a puny little fellow. I know I can manhandle him. At this age, I can manhandle him. I can do that. But shh, if I did that, you know who I'm fighting? The whole government. And if I can defeat this your police force here, then the army, the navy, the air force, eh, the whole country will be after me. No. <laughs> so when says God sends the man, you deny him. you do not god this is you are like a god like a god but the genius of the jewish language they didn't say like the word like if you look like me i say you are me and i'm you i didn't say you are like me and i am like you no they didn't use that that is the genius of the language she said is it not written in your law i said yeah god and here moses is called a god so i says you know what you have done what you have done you are playing fast and loose with this book what you are doing now when this word god is used for moses they put a small g me or my any pronoun they put a small m small h him or his when they refer to jesus capital h his capital h he capital m my if he was described as a god they would have put a capital g see this is they play fast and loose you know wherever it suits them <laughs> the other night the young man that another born again came along he says you know an angel told mary i said right what is the greek word there is agelos agelos means angel but the disciples of john came to see jesus when they came to see jesus the word there in greek is agelos but you don't try to translate that as angels you say disciples why do you do that when the disciple of jesus when he seen you say angel because his written is greek is agelos okay what about the disciples of john yahya alayhi salam his disciples are also described in greek as agelos why do you translate that as disciples so it is a game that is being played i said look where does he say i am god who oh, where does he say worship me so i said you know in the gospel of saint john chapter 1 verse 1 so what does it say it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so i said you know greek he said yes i said in the beginning was the it was the word and the word was with god i said what is the greek word for with god there so he's silent he said he did 5 years greek before he became a dd so i said what is the greek word there for god is silent i said the greek word is hotios hotios it literally means the god for which you western nations we have a system of translation that when it is a proper noun you put a capital letter when it is a common noun you put a small letter so you have put a capital g for god right that's your system and the word was god i said what is the greek word there for god is silent i said the word there is tontios tontios means a god Why did you put another capital G there? A God should have a small G, no? A God, a godly person. That's what he's trying to say. It's a godly word. Why did you give a put a capital G there? He said, "I didn't do that." I said, "I know you didn't do that, <laughs> but the vested interest that you represent. What are you doing?" Then I said, "In two Corinthians four four, it says the devil is the god of this world, Shaitan. He is the god, and he is the ruler." Shaitan is ruling the lives of people. He said, the, "The devil is the god of this world. The Greek word is hotios. Why do you give him a small g? Why don't you give him a capital G? Because he's the god. For Moses, why don't you give him a capital G? Why do you give him a small g? 
Because in Greek, there is no such thing as a capital G, no such thing as a small g. In Hebrew, no such thing as a capital G, no such thing as a small g. In Arabic, no such thing as a capital G, and no such thing as a small g. See, this is the game that the guys are playing. Allah. What makes him God? He said, no, he is born without a father. He had no father, so he must have a father. You must give him a father. So his father is God. So Allah says, Inna masala Isa inda Allahi kamasali Adama. He says, most certainly the similitude, the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is like that of Adam. Adam al Islam. Khalaqahum in Turabin. He created him from dust. Thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. And he said, Be and he was. This is it. Jesus had no father, if that makes God his father, and he becomes a veritable son of God, as God, because they say he is the begotten son of God, so the begotten son must be like the father. If the father is an Indian, the son is an Indian. The father is a Greek, the son is a Greek. The father is a Chinese, the son is a Chinese. Natural. So if the father is God, then the son is God, begotten son. Shala says, no, this is not so in the Bible. He's got sons by the tons, tons, you know, tons, you can put them in the scale, tons, tons of sons. Sounds exaggeration. But I give it to you, references. Look, look, in the New Testament, chapter 3, verse 38. Ah, in the same, I think it's not the same verse. They know, it says, Adam, which was the son of God, is written there, Adam, which was the son of God. Luke chapter 3 verse 38. Is he not the son of God? You ask them, in the Bible, the Nib Bible, he says, the one and only son Jesus. I said, look, this one and only son you're talking about, Luke says, and Adam, the son of God. Same New Testament. How can you have one and only, and you have Adam, the son of God? They had the word begotten there before. Jesus, the only begotten son. And we took exception to that. He says, begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. How can you attribute such a quality to God that God begot a son? How can God beget? He can create by his act of will. But he doesn't beget. He doesn't take his seed and plant it into other people's wives and daughters. By artificial insemination or any other way. This is not his, this is not his way. He creates by his act of will. So, Adam, the son of God. It's not all. Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, chapter 6, verse 2 and 4. He said that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them to wife all that they chose. And when the sons of God, sins from hot, when they came in unto the daughters of men and bore children to them, they became great men of old men of renown. How many sons did he have? Sons, sins, plural. He had them by the tons, I'm telling you. Exodus, second book of the Bible, chapter 4, verse 2, verse 22, I mean, sorry. Israel is my son, God says. This is the Jewish language, you see. Israel means Yaakov, salam. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. He's even my firstborn. The same God in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 9, he says, For I, God, am a father to Israel to the Jews. And Ephraim is my son, my firstborn. And Ephraim is my firstborn. I said, how can you have two firstborns? Israel is his firstborn. Ephraim is his firstborn. In the book of Psalms, God speaks to David, according to their book, according to their Bible. God says to Dawud alayhi salam, I will declare a decree unto thee that thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. I brought you into being today. This day have I begotten you. Thou art my son. How many sons has he got? He's got them by their tons. In your book. But yet they have the audacity to say, One and only son, Jesus. He so said, what are you reading? This book? In your book? How do you account? You know, you, I don't know how you can talk to people like that. How can you talk to people like that? You know, the book is written simple, basic language. You speak, you say, look, you say one. Any other son? He says, no. I said, who is this? Adam is the son of God. 
Israel is the son of God. Ephraim is the son of God. David is the son of God. And further, in the New Testament, we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Means every Tom, Dick and Harry, if you follow the will and plan of God, you are a godly person. In the language of the Jew, you are a son of God. It meant nothing more than that. It was a metaphorical statement. See? But they say, no, he was begotten. See, Adam was made by God. Jesus was begotten. I says, Paul gives a knockout to all this. Paul, the 13th self-appointed apostle of Jesus. He appointed himself. In the book of Hebrews, he wrote. He wrote the book of Hebrews. Chapter 7, verses 1 and 3. He says, For this Melchizedek, Malik, Sadek Saleh, Melchizedek, that's how it's, King of Salam, Salam, King of Salam, peace, King of Salam, priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, without father, he says, without father, without mother, greater than Jesus, Jesus had a mother, see, he says, without father, all right, so Jesus had no father. This man also got no father. Without mother, Jesus had a mother. So he's superior to Jesus. Your, your own logic, your own reasoning. We are not producing anything from the Quran, producing from your own book. That this man, Melchizedek, is greater than Jesus according to your standards, your false standards. He's greater. Without father, without mother. Without descent, Jesus had a descent. To a certain extent, they give him 66 fathers and grandfathers in two gene genealogies. Descent. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, and Abraham began Isaac and Isaac. Two genealogies they give him. Descent. How he came down. From where? Sixty-six fathers and grandfathers they give him. A man who had no father. They give him sixty-six fathers and grandfathers. In the book. This man, Melchizedek, no descent, no genealogy. Having neither the beginning of days nor the end of life. No beginning of days, no end of life. Jesus, Adam had a beginning and he had an end. Isa alayhi salam, he had a beginning in the stable and he had, according to the Christians, an apparent end. He died on the cross. He gave up the ghost. That's what he says. Is it true? He said, yes. He said, right, he had an end. All right, he came back for a second inning. That's different. But the first inning, he was knocked out. This man, Melchizedek, no beginning, no end. I'm asking, please, man, who is greater, Jesus or Melchizedek? Put Adam one side. Leave poor Adam one side. He had enough trouble. <laughs> oh, his miracles make him God. I said, look, man, this poor man is telling you, he's telling you, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18, he says, all power is given unto me, is given to me, is not mine. Chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12 verse 28, he said, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. It God's help I'm doing this, casting out devils. Then the kingdom of God is come unto you. John chapter 5 verse 30, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. Nothing I can do of myself. God can do everything of himself. He doesn't need anybody. He says, I can do nothing of myself. He said, as I hear, I judge. Whatever God tells me to do, to say, I say. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Where does he say it is his own power he is doing things? Luke chapter 11 verse 20 said, I with the finger of God cast out devils means with Allah's help, I'm casting out devils. Where does he say he is doing the works? Nowhere. The greatest miracle that Jesus performed was, according to the scriptures, giving life back to the dead. One of his disciples called Lazarus, he had died. And Jesus wasn't there to help him out in his sakaratul mouth. Dead pangs, he wasn't there. And when Jesus reaches there, four days late, the man is dead and buried. Not buried, put in a sepulchre, in a room, big room in his chamber. Sepulchre, not grave. 
So Jesus comes and Martha, the sister of Lazarus, she's crying, wailing. John chapter 11 verse 40. This is when, uh, starting from 33. So when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, Martha, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit. He groaned. You know what's groaning? You cry out to God. You know, you speak, you speak in words, but those words are not audible enough for the neighbor to hear. Says, the guy is groaning. He's not groaning. He's talking to Allah. Says, oh Lord, have mercy upon him. Whatever you're talking. So he's, he says, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. 34. And said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. 35. Verse 35. Jesus wept. You can remember this. The shortest sentence in the Bible. In the whole Bible encyclopedia, the shortest sentence somebody asks you, you can win a prize one day. Shortest sentence in the Bible is Jesus wept. Two words. Shortest sentence. Remember that. You'll win a prize one day. Verse 36. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Verse 37. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself. Groaning. What's groaning? He's praying to God. He's offering a silent prayer. So, oh my Lord, my friend is gone. You know, bring him back to life. But now the words are not audible to the people. They say, what he's doing? We don't know what he's talking about. He's groaning. They say he's groaning. He's not groaning. Come up to the grave. It was a cave, cave, not a hollow. And a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He must be stinking. For he had been dead four days. Jesus says unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, if you have iman, if you have faith, thou should see the glory of God. Not my glory, Allah's glory. If you have faith, iman, you can still see Allah's glory, Allah's power, what he can do. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes towards heaven. And said, Father, now he's talking loudly. All the while he was groaning, means he was silent prayer. Communing with God. Now he wants the people to hear. He says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. What? That groaning. He was offering a prayer. He said, now I, know. I thank you. You heard my prayer. Means now he gets the assurance. Allah tells him, go ahead, ask what you want. I'll give it to you. It's a matter between the beloved and the master. He says, God says, like, ask what you want. You get it. He says, that thou hast heard me. And I know. And I know, he says. And I knew, verse 42, and I knew that thou hearest me always. Means whatever I'm asking, you're giving me. Healing the blind, the lepers, quickening the dead. Whatever I'm asking, you always, you hear me. Doesn't mean that he's deaf at any time. No, means you're answering my prayers every time. Whatever I ask, you give me. I know that you hear me always. But because of the people that stood by, these people, superstitious, credulous people, they might think, I did it. I'm a god. Giving life to the dead. For that I'm putting up a performance. Oh my father, I know that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always. But because of these people, this superstitious lot, credulous people, they might think I did it. I want them to know I'm not doing it. It's you who's doing the works. That they may believe that thou hast sent me. That they may believe that thou hast sent, that you sent me. That I'm sent by you. I'm a true messenger of God. That's all. That's why I'm putting up an act. All the while the groaning, he is doing silent prayer. When he gets the assurance, he says, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. Why? Because God had assured him, go ahead and ask what you want, you get it. He gave him a blank check. It's not his, it was given to him. He called, he used it and he got it. And Peter, the greatest of the disciples of Jesus, according to Jesus, he said, I give you the, the keys of heaven. He says, on this rock, he first, on this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This Peter, he testifies in the book of Acts, in the Bible. 
chapter 2, verse 22. He said, Ye men of Israel, O Jews, hear these words. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, a man approved of God among you. A man, not a God. A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him. Which God did by him. He was only using him to press the button to put on the switch. The power was not his. It came from the power station. Which God did by him in the midst of you which you yourself also know. Where did he say Jesus gave life to the dead? Where did he give life to the dead? Did he say he gave life to the dead? No, this is given to me. All power is given unto me. It's not his. On the cross, imagine a God crying. He cries. This is according to the Christian scriptures. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is God. This is what the Christians say. And he's crying to somebody else. That you have let me down. How can he as a God let himself down? If he didn't want to be let down. Look, simple logic. How can he's God? And he's crying to somebody else. Who is that somebody else? That somebody else is a real God. And his name? You know what is his name? Allah. He's crying to Allah. There, he's there in the book. But the Christian is so programmed, he sees it and he doesn't see. He's hearing and he's not hearing. I'm asking, and you can ask them, these Christians, these Jehovah's Witnesses. They say his name is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. We said, look, when Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, does that sound like to you like Jehovah, Jehovah, lama sabachthani? Ask him. In the most critical moment of a person's life, when you cry for your mother in your mother tongue, for your father or for anybody in your mother tongue, he's crying to who? To Jehovah? No. Does it sound like to be like Jehovah, Jehovah, anybody? No. You need some ear treatment. If you are hearing Jehovah, Jehovah. This is Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Ask the Jews, ask the other Christians. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Does that sound like, like Abba? Abba, Lama Sabachthani? Sound like Abba, Abba. Abba means father in Hebrew. No. Listen again. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani in Hebrew. Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani in Arabic. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani. Does it sound similar? Yes. He's crying to Allah. And this word Allah was in this Bible here. I think it's still here. Yeah, this Bible. Schofield Bible, reference Bible. In the book of Genesis, first chapter, chapter, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word God is given a small number to give you further explanation. And in that explanation, these, Reverend Dr. Schofield, backed by eight DDs, not DDs, eight DDs, they backed him up and they, they gave the explanation that God in Hebrew is El or Elah, alternatively spelled as Allah, A-L-A-H, Elah. So the only exception I took, that's about 15 years ago, I said, look, you can spell it as you like, but my language I want you to pronounce the way I asked you to pronounce. Try, I know you can't make it, but try, be sincere, try and make an effort. It is not Elah, it's Allah. Not Allah, it's Allah. Say Allah. Allah. So when I made this, I said, look, here it is. They have come very close now. From E-L-A-H, now they got A-L-A-H. Only thing I'm saying, you must pronounce it the way I ask you to pronounce. Allah, you can spell it. But say Allah, not Allah. You know what? In the next Kofil Bible, <laughs> they took it out. The word Allah is taken out. You know, amazing, the games that they play. As if they are following me, wherever I'm going, whatever I'm speaking. Look, I'm talking about this book now, that Kim, what's it, Kim? Uh, new, new Bible. <laughs> the Ascension of Jesus, John chapter, uh, Mark chapter 16. They have, they took it out in the authorized, the revised standard version, they threw it out. Ascension was thrown out. Now they put it back into that one. And in the footnote they say, in the most, in the most, Reliable manuscripts, these verses are not there. 
most reliable ancient manuscripts, the verses about the ascensions are not there. But they got it here. I say, if most reliable haven't got it, then this must be less reliable or least reliable. And you passing that off as the word of God. This is all discovered today. I brought bought this from that Bible haze in Cape Town. Right. So I said that the name of God Almighty is Allah, not Jehovah. What is Jehovah? You ask him, where did you get it from? Ask these guys. They come and knock at your doors. They say, where did you get this word Jehovah from? He says, it's in the Bible. So what is in the Bible? Jehovah in the original? He said, no, 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 no. There is a tetragrammaton. So what is a tetragrammaton? It was a two-yard word long. Two-yard long word. What is a tetragrammaton? So he said, why HWH? I said, no, 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 man. I want you to tell me what does tetragrammaton mean? And he doesn't know. You know, he's bending it around. This was tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton. These guys also are thumb-sucking the Jehovah's Witnesses now. The new Bible. They also talk about the tetragrammaton. A 14-letter word, tetragrammaton. To describe a four-letter word. Tetra means four and grammaton means letters. Instead of saying a four-letter word, they say tetragrammaton. As if it's a new revelation came down from heaven. Even they're, they're tantalizing you, mystifying you. See, they have some, some reasons for not using the word. It is tetra means four, grammaton means letters. Four, simple word, tetragrammaton. But instead of saying four letters, they say tetragrammaton. And believe me, in the University of Illinois, in America, I'm speaking to professors and students, and somehow the subject popped up, and I'm asking them, is there anybody here who knows what is a tetragrammaton? And believe me, not a single professor, not a single student in the University of Illinois, he knew what was a tetragrammaton. But every Tom, Dick, and Harry among the Jehovah's Witnesses, he knows it. <laughs> he knows it. The professors don't know. You go and ask anybody, else, what is a tetragrammaton? Go and ask your Christian friends. They don't know what it is. Fourteen-letter word to describe a four-letter word. Because when you say four-letter word, it conjures up in your mind. You remember I told association of memories? That word for which Lady Chatterley's lover was banned in South Africa. One word. A four-letter word. So they don't, therefore they don't say four-letter. They say tetragrammaton. New Wahi. So what is a tetragrammaton? He say Y-H-W-H. I said, well, these are consonants. Produce a sound. You can't. You have to add vowels. I say, add them as you like. As you like. Add the vowels to produce the sound. So it becomes Yahuwah, Yehovah, anything. Pronounce. Where do you get the J from? Where do you get the J from? Say Jehovah. You remember I told you? J sickness. They got a J sickness. Anything J. Where there's no J, J. To make it sound like, you know, it's a European name now. Jehovah. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, you read there. That, that the disciple John, supposed to have seen a vision. And in the vision he heard the angels in heaven singing. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. And in my previous meeting in the city hall, Durban, you know, when a Christian came along and he interjected or did something, all the other Christians would say, Alleluia! Alleluia! Shh, they vibrated the heart. You know? They're good, enthusiastic. So I said, you know what you're shouting? You know what is Alleluia? See, Ya is a vocative, an exclamation in Hebrew and Arabic. Yahua means O, He. Because the J is an invention of the Westerner. Jehovah. I said, throw it out. The original is Y-H-W-H, you add the vowels, it becomes Yahuwah. Ya is a vocative exclamation. Hua in Arabic means he, and hu in Hebrew means he. So it is Hua el ela. It says, it says Allah lu. Ya is ya. We begin with an exclamation. The Eastern people, we start with an exclamation. The Westerner, he ends with an exclamation. This is his language, genius of a language. We say, Ya khi. Oh my brother, Ya Ummi, oh my mother. Don't you talk like that? Ya Allah, oh Allah. We start with the Ya, he ends with the Ya, the exclamation. So fire, say fire, fire, exclamation mark. Stop, S T O P. stop, exclamation mark. That's his way. We start with an exclamation, he ends with an exclamation. So Allah Lu, Ya is Ya Allah Lu, Ya Allah Lu, Ya Allah Hu, Ya Allah Hu. This is what we are singing. The angels in heaven are singing. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. 
Look, you do a little bit of study. This is all you will get in this booklet of mine. What is his name? You will get in the other booklet. Is the Bible God's word? You owe it to yourself to write for these books. If you haven't got them, get them, read them, study them, and use them. Because if you just read for entertainment, you lose them. What you're listening now, you lose it if you don't use it. Now, a final knockout Allah gives to this idea that any human being can ever be God. A final knockout. You read this in Surah An'am, chapter 6, verse 14. Allah says, Qul, غَيْرَ اللَّهُ وَاتَّخِذُ وَلِيًا Say, tell them, eh, shall we take for ourselves anybody other than Allah as our protector? Qul, غَيْرَ اللَّهُ وَاتَّخِذُ وَلِيًا فاتر السماوات والأرض When he is the originator of the heavens and the earth, our Lord, our protector, our cherisher, he is the protector, he is the originator of the heavens and the earth. وَهُوَ يُتْعِمُ وَلَا يُتْعَمُ When it is he who feeds but is not fed, that's his quality. He feeds his creation but nobody feeds him. This is God. One who is not fed, who doesn't eat, who doesn't need food, who is not dependent. And move directly to Jesus. In chapter 5 verse 78, Allah says, Mal Masih ibn Maryama illa Rasul. Say, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, is no more than a messenger. Qad khalat min qabli rusul. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. Human, they were all mortal. Wa ummuhu siddika. And his mother was a saintly woman. His mother was a saintly woman. Good woman, pious woman. Wa ummuhu siddika. Kana ya'kulani ta'am. And they both ate food. What is Allah telling you? They were dependent. Without food they would have died. God doesn't need food. He's independent of all needs. Kana yakulani ta'am. And they both had food. Unzur. See how we make our signs clear to you. How easy we are trying to make things easy for you to understand. That the person who eats food is dependent. The person who eats food, he has a call of nature. He runs to the toilet or the bush. Anybody. Whether it's a Moses or a Jesus or a Muhammad or a Rama or a Krishna. Anybody who eats food will have a call of nature. He's dependent. God is independent. Unzur is see. How we are making things simple, easy for you to understand. Fools that we are. Look, he's telling you. Sum manzur anna yufikul. Have another look. How they have strayed away from the path. Unzur, have a look. Sum manzur, have another look. I'm asking, what is he talking about? What is he drawing your attention to what? Here, yeah, Allah is giving you weapons to fight with. These guys come along and make a nest in your head and you allow them to do that. He's telling you, Unzur, Sum Mansur. Did he eat food? Yes, he says. He says, and they gave him Jesus a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. And he took it. And he had did khanyam and fuar hala uakha yet. Luke chapter 24, verse 42. He ate. Dependent. The Prophet of Islam, dependent. You know, the primitive man, he is far superior to the civilized cultured man. Can you imagine today in the 20th century, people are worshipping men and monkeys, elephants and snakes, worshipping the devil, worshipping Sun Myung Moon in America, the white man, Sun Myung Moon, Hare Krishna, worshipping Krishna, the Guru Maharaji, worshipping him, Swami Prabhupada, worshipping him, the devil, they got a Satan, worshipping cult, worshipping Shaitan. But the primitive man, you find this in my book, what is his name? The Aborigine of South Australia, very primitive man. In his native language, he can't speak more than 1200 words. The monkey chatters about 700. He is the closest cousin to the monkey, poor man, very backward. But in his language, he has given a name to God. It is so beautiful, so perfect that it has saved him from being Christianized. 
Nobody, nobody can go and Christianize or you go and Hinduize this Aboriginal of South Australia. Because he has a concept of God given to him by his primitive ancestors. And that he gives God a name. He calls him Atnatu. Atnatu. And that is his saving grace. It is something that protects him from any kind of wrong concept of God. You go to him and you tell him that, you know, Jesus Christ is God. So he will ask you, is he Atnatu? Atnatu means, you see, when we eat, we excrete. The tail end of the elementary channel is what he calls Atnatu. So he'll say, is he Atnatu? Is he without that? You say, no, this is no good. <laughs> you say, Rama is God. He says, is he Atnatu? Is he without that? He said, no, this is no good. Some silly fool might go and tell him, he said, look, Muhammad is God. You know what, what he did? He said, is he Atnatu? He says, no, this is no good. Beautiful, Allah, I tell you. Allah is telling the same thing. See, that primitive man has got no inhibitions. Look, I am using language. Can you see, I'm trying very hard not to use the word. <laughs> the primitive man, he had no inhibitions. He spoke very freely. So he called a spade a spade. I can't call a spade a spade. <laughs> because you people are hypersensitive. Sensitive. In the age of the hypermarkets, you, our, 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 our emotions are also become hypersensitive. You get upset very quickly if I use a word. If I use a biblical word, people get upset. A word from the Bible, if I use, you're going to say, Didad is a filthy, dirty fellow. If I read from the Bible, verses, you say, Didad is a filthy, filthy minded. Didad is a filthy mind. I don't know what to do. So, God Almighty, as He says, Munzur Sum Mansur. It is an advice to us. Go to town with that fellow man. Go to him. Speak to him. Atna too. You can knock him for a sixer with that Atna too. Because that's what Allah is telling you, but He's telling you in a noble, sublime language. He's telling you the same thing. So, Unzur, Sum Mansur, He's telling you the same thing. See, man, see. Can't you see? Are you blind? They both had food. They had the call of nature. Can't you understand? I'm telling you this, that you may understand. And look how they have deviated. Can't you see? I end <laughs> this talk of mine. It must come to an end. With a warning. With a warning from the Quran, which you have to carry on. Allah says, Chapter 4, Surah Nisa, verse 171. Kitab, O people of the book, La taghlu fi He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes. The Jew and the Christians are both going to extremes. The Jew says, because Jesus has not got a father, he is an illegitimate child of Mary. I won't use that other word, biblical word. Three times it occurs in the Bible, that filthy, dirty word. If I say, you'll get shocked just now. He says, the Jew says he's the illegitimate child of Mary. The Christian says, because he's got no human father, his father is God. So, do not go to extremes in your religion. And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. Innamal Masih, most certainly the Messiah. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is a messenger of Allah, wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him. Al-Qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa'aminu billahi wa rusulihi, so believe in Allah and his messenger. Jesus Christ, that he is a man sent by God. He is a true prophet of God, but he is not God, and he is not his son. He is not the begotten son of anybody. He was created by a miracle. Take this message, deliver it. Because Allah will question us in the day of judgment, have you delivered your message? That He will question you. He won't ask you about Jesus. You know what He was eating? Who was trimming His beard? That's not your business. This is not a part of our curriculum. But He will ask you, did you deliver the message? And if we can say, Ya Bari Tala, to the best of my ability, which might be very little, He won't ask you, why didn't you talk like this? That? Or Maulana Razak, or Sheikh Najjar. Hmm. He won't ask you. 
Did you deliver the message? He said, Ya Bari Tala, to the best of my ability. He said, my jannah is open for you. Wallah, that's all. To the best of my ability. You do according to your ability. You don't have to be like Didat, you don't have to wish like Sheikh Nazim, Sheikh Najjar, anybody else, Imam Baker. You don't have to be like anybody. You be yourself. What little you know, pass it on. Wa akhiru da'wana anil. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmad Didat. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that it isn't easy to speak for one and a half hours. And this has been the pace at which Brother Ahmad has been going for eight nights, missing only Sunday night. I'm sure that all of us sitting here, even those of us who perhaps don't agree with anything he says, because there are some people who come to the meeting prepared to disagree, even those of us who don't agree with some of the things he said, he says, we must accept that the man is well versed in the subject which he undertakes to speak about. We come to the close of our evening of lecturing. And I am emphatic, I am emphatic with that. We come to the close of our evening of lecturing. We now ask that if there are any people who would like to put a question, I repeat, anybody who would like to put a question, then you are free to come up to the microphone in front here. And because we are a working community and it is in during the week, we would like to be as brief as possible. If there is more than one person to put a question, we ask you all to come up to the microphone and please stand in the line. Let us not wait. Anybody therefore who is not in the line at the microphone, you must forgive me if I stop you from coming up afterwards. When you put your questions, I would like you to ask one question at a time. And if you have put your question, you should expect an answer. Quiet, please. You should expect an answer. Please then go. Just hold it. Please then go to the back of the line to wait your turn in case you have another question. We will not, and I can assure you, I will not entertain any debate. I will not entertain any lecture from the front. And John, with all due respects to you, but if you can tell me how one asks a question with a chart, I would like to know. But just hold it. Uh, you are free to ask a question. So those people who come up now and who are coming up, you are then accepting the fact that you're coming to ask a question. And if you don't ask a question, I'm going to stop you. And if you ask a question which does not pertain to the lecture that was said tonight, or was done tonight, we will also stop you. But I ask everybody that when question time is over, please remain behind just for the close of the evening. John, over to you. This is just in point of correction. Hold it, John. Please, I said, put a question. If you haven't got a question, please go to the back of the line. Right, okay. I'll put my question. Mr. Ahmad did that. Last week has told me that if I can prove to him about the Trinity, he'll give me the chance Tuesday. So here I have the thing for him. If you would like to give me the chance as brief as possible, Mr. Ahmad did that. He wants to deliver a lecture on the Trinity. I don't want to deliver a lecture, I just want to... Yes, John, please. I said, you had even a Sunday morning with Mr. Ahmad Yes. Yeah. Two hours. In fairness to those people who may have a question which is more pertinent, which pertains to tonight, I think in fairness, then please let somebody else take over. Would you go mm -hmm. to the back, please? No, Mr. Ahmad. Shh. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didat, ladies and gentlemen, may I appeal that 
um, humbly that you would change your rules a little bit. Firstly, that one can pose the full question. Look, we have listened for one and a half hours, and I think it would only be fair if you could give us at least two and a half minutes to fully bring forward a question. Sir, may I be, let me, Yes. I hope you don't misquote me or misunderstand me. Right. Yes. If you are capable of coming to put a question, and I'm, I'm trying even to change my expression, if you are capable of coming to put a question, it means that you should have listened. I trust you didn't spend sure. the time there by preparing uh, uh, whatever you wish to know. I'm going to be very emphatic. And if you quote me as being unfair, then I say I accept the blame. I asked, please put the question, I'm going to insist. If the man has said something and you want clarity for yourself or for the people here, if you have the ability to change a statement into a question, to change anything, I think any person who knows a little bit of the language, he can put a statement into a form of a question. Certainly, I want to do that. My question is only, can I speak more than six sentences? Because you interrupted me yesterday night after the sixth sentence. So, you can't understand the question unless, unless you listen to the whole. And it might take I maybe two minutes question, to put the whole point, question just, forward. Just point one, one correction, please, for you. May I quote last night and on the night before, uh, or some evening, you said, I cannot see how all the Muslims can sit still without asking a question, without doubting. In other words, you're thinking for them. Now you're under, now you give the impression that Mr. Dinat will not understand you if you cannot put a text. Please, I've read now three minutes. Could you put the question, see Thank if he knows you. the text? Okay, if you give me three minutes. Um, Mr. Dinat said that if uh, Jesus would have claimed to be God, he would immediately bow down, uh, even be cut off his head. Now, for me, the crucial question is not whether somebody um, claims to be God, but whether God appoints him and authorizes him to be God. May I read to you what God says uh, on I? Jesus Christ? Yeah. Please, that is the question. And I would like to ask what Mr. Didat thinks to that. Um, God says about Jesus Christ, about the Son, he says, that is in Hebrew, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, if you want to read, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. Brother, they will be changed, but brother, you remain the same, and your ears brother, will never end. Now, my question is, um, this is clearly stated about Jesus Christ, about the Son. Right, how, can Mr. I, I how can Mr. Didat claim that now, before Jesus was not authorized as right, before God. the others come up let me say you know out of uh, tolerance i didn't wish anybody here even my brethren would cut me up if they feel that i've cut you up mm -hmm. but i say if a lecture is given and we state what the conditions are i ask you please to accept and i said those people who are coming up now are then accepting those terms we've allowed it with you in case you think i'm being unfair would the others please formulate a question if you don't mind sorry that right? was a question yes but I my mean, question uh, is uh, Mr. Didat, how can this statement say anything else than that Jesus is God? I think that is quite I think what has happened is, uh, Mr. Chairman, our brother doesn't understand English, or my English at that. Hmm. I said there is not a single unequivocal statement where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. You quoted a lengthy text, and there's not one word about Jesus. Is Mr. Jesus Mr. speaking that? Did he, Jesus speak that? God speaks about Jesus. That is more authoritative. Look, who told you that God spoke that? It's Paul. Here in scripture. Look, this is Hebrew. It says here in scripture. Hebrew was written by Paul. I am asking, what did no, your Lord Jesus say? Spoke. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. That's not the point. He the point says, is what God says about you, he not says, what you say about He himself. says, my father is greater than I. He says, my father is greater than all. Right. Where does he say, I am equal to the father? Could Wait, I have or a... I am the father. Well, he is his own yourself. father. Where does he say? Look, we could are I, could I have the next question, please? I think you've had your chance. But it was not answered. I'm sorry. I no, no, well, that is your opinion. You're entitled to it. I... Please. Yeah. Mr. Didat, may I read my question to you? The question is, can Jesus 
be an ordinary man or prophet if he is stated to be faultless and without sin. We believe that all the prophets are faultless and all the prophets are sinless. That is our belief, including Jesus. So that doesn't make him any a God. See, we say, person is Jesus God. If the man is faultless, man is faultless is man. Peter says, he says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Not a God approved of God. He is a man. We say he is a mighty messenger of God. He is a prophet of God. He is a messiah. He is a great miracle worker, but he is not God. And he is saying that himself. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. God can do everything of himself. Whatever God wants to do, he can do, but Jesus is limited. He can't. He said, of that day, no, but no man, no, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father in heaven. In his, in his knowledge is not like God. In his power is not like God. He is crying some, to somebody else, God for help. He is falling on his face and he is praying. He is crying on the cross, Eli, Eli. Is he himself, he is Eli. Is he God himself? He is crying to himself. He seems like a drama. They do it in films. I said, Jesus is not film acting. He is crying to God. And the one he's crying to, the Father in heaven. He is the real God. Not Jesus. He told us, come, I'll teach you how to pray. He said, pray like this. Oh, our Father, which art in heaven, yours and mine, including Judas, because Judas was in the group, he's the Father of all. Where did he say God is his exclusive Father? That he begot him. Where? No, these are all our... You know, it's the teaching of the church. Jesus Christ never said. On the contrary, he's proving that there is but one God and he is subservient to God. He said, all power is given to me. It's not mine. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but, except one, that is God. Where does he say he is that God? That is what I was asking. Show me and I am prepared to accept. Follow your church. Next question, please. Thank you, sir. May I have more than one question if I go back? Yes, yes. Thank you. Mr. Didad, if you quote Acts 2.22, where Peter says that Jesus did by, the, by God's power the miracles, which is right, then why would you not accept what Peter says in, later in the book of Acts, particularly 4 verse 12, uh, about under no other name is anyone saved except by Jesus? Thank you. uh, you're not trying to prove by that that Jesus is God, I hope. Uh, no, I'm trying to prove that, uh, that if you take one source, then why not? No, no. I would be prepared to accept that. I said, look, he's talking to the Jews. Ye men of Israel, you Jews. Because Jesus came for the Jews. And in his time, Jesus' time, there was no other way. It was identical to in the time of Moses. In the time of Moses, we said Moses was the way to God. The children of Israel, they thought it through the golden calf. God didn't like it. He said, look, this is what I want. You have to go through Moses. Whatever Moses tells you about God, you have to accept. In the time of David, David was the way to God. In the time of Solomon, Solomon was the way to God. In the time of Jesus, Jesus was the way to God. In the time of Muhammad, he is the way to God and for mankind for eternity. So in every dispensation, the man of God is the firstborn of God. He is a representative of God. And as such, you must listen to him. That's what it means. So I accept that. That the people, the Jews, they had no other way because there was no Muhammad there. If they wanted to follow Jesus, they must listen to now Peter, he is represented. Peter says, look, this is what Jesus wanted you to believe, that he is your Messiah. Follow him, follow him. Salvation is yours. Thank you. Mr. Didar, um, I must admit that you know the scriptures very well, but you don't understand them. Um, Mr. Didar, um, I don't uh, proclaim to have to answer your questions, but I would like you to explain two questions. Uh, I'd like you to explain two issues, you know, to me. And that is the first one, when Peter walked on the water to Jesus, um, then he, he sunk into the water. Jesus stooped down to help him, and then when they both got into the both according to the Bible it says that they worshipped him in categorical English you on previous lectures recently said and explained it away 
that uh, Thomas um, exclaimed, Oh, my Lord and my God, in a way of uh, getting a fright. But in a case like that, I'm sure that Jesus would have rebuked him, knowing the law of the commandments, don't take the name of your God in vain, because that would be clearly taking God's name in vain. Would you kindly just explain that to me? There was nothing about Peter, Peter worshipping Jesus. You see, this worship, this word worship, you open your new Bible now, new Bible, you'll find a different word for worship. You'll open the RSV, you'll find a different word for worship. You see? Right, but what, what, what are the alternative? what are the synonyms used for worship? And everyone is worship. Right, now, now to the Jew, if the Jew worshipped Jesus, you see, that means all the disciples were worshipping him. If Peter worshipped him, then all the other disciples likewise must be worshipping him, because Peter was the leader of the disciples. But we find nowhere the disciples ever prostrating before Jesus at any time. The eleven or the twelve worshipping him. Worshipping him means that you are our God. You see, this word worship, you ask the Roman Catholic. Look, they ha have a good knowledge of the scriptures. You know, they claim an unbroken chain of hopes from First Peter to today. Now you ask them how many types of worships are there? And they will tell you there are three different types of worship. Right? You say about your sweetheart, your fiancé says, I worship her. But when you say you worship her, you mean you love her extremely, you know, beyond measure. But you're not taking her for a goddess. Look, this is an expression we use commonly. It says, you, you know, you're worshipping the guy. You, it says, money my God, woman my guide, says the Frenchman. We say you are worshipping money, you're worshipping women. But you don't say, money is my God, or you don't say, woman is my God. But you use the word worship. Worship is an extreme form of love. He must have been very much humiliated. And, you know, in lovingness, he must have embraced a man, which, according to your King James Version, has used the word worship. But now, if he was worshipped as God, that would be something. He said, now look, he is our God. Then he must say so. Then he said, look, they were all worshipping him. But at no time do we hear that they ever worshipped him as a people instead of worshipping God. He's telling you, come, worship God, the Father in heaven. He is the only God. He's the real God. No time did he say, I am God, worship me. Did he? At any time, if he said, look, I am God. Yes, yes, I'm, yes, you can answer that. If he said, no, no, if he said, I am God, this is the claim I made, I think, No good, no good. You see, the, I, I made a claim, very simple, straightforward. If you can show me in your Bible any version where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. Simple English I'm speaking. Where he says, I am God, I said, I'm prepared to accept him as God. If he says, worship me, I'm prepared to worship him. He must say, not Peter, not James, not Paul. He must say, I am God. He must say, worship me. Because if he is God, my salvation depends upon that. And I don't want to go to hell. I want to follow him. Now that is just, may I interject you there? That's the very point of issue there. Now, you are describing mannerisms of worshipping where the Bible doesn't um, elaborate on at all. Jesus but, does. But the fact remains is, the, uh, the, the disciples worshipped him in the boat. And he allowed it. And that's Jesus, all it says. Jesus, Jesus showed you how to worship. In the garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, he said he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Yes, Didn't he? I set you an example. With respect, is, uh, you are reading an, uh, uh, words into the Bible. You, you find that verse in Matthews. And he went a little further. Oh, except the fact that he, he, he dropped down on his face right. and so on. So, so but that, mean, uh, that makes no eyes. The fact he made the Jews, his disciples the Jews. worshiping. No, no, how did the Jews worship? Look, if you want to know the Muslims how they worship, you go to the mosque. Go to the mosque and see how they worship. You see, Sallallahu Akbar. They stand, they read chapters and verses, they go into semi-bend position, they get up, they go down to the ground, touching the forehead onto the earth. This is how the Muslims worship, right? So if I said, look, this chairman or the people worship Didat, meaning that they, man, they loved him with exceeding love. Right. That, but now you say worship. Now, 
that if the people have a wrong idea, they say, look, what did they do? Did they make evolution and come? And did they fall down prostrate before Mr. Didat? He says, no. He says, what do you mean they worshipped him? He says, no, no, no. Oh, man, you know, they were gone mad after him. Now, that's quite a different thing. You see, now you are using a word and you are explaining something else figuratively. But that's exactly so, what you are doing now. No, I'm not doing that. Jesus Christ and all the prophets, they had a form of worship, the Jews, which you are not following, you don't know. Look, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. And Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. Look, everybody falling on their faces and praying. What is this? This is the way you worship God. Fall on your face and pray. The Pope, wherever he goes, he kisses the ground. He makes a prostration, as a Muslim does. See, he's maybe, I don't know, he's communing with the soil or what, I don't know. But he's doing exactly as a Muslim does. He, then you might say he's worshiping the ground. He goes to Nigeria, he worships the ground there. He goes to Poland, he worships the ground there. No, he's not worshipping. There is. He's showing some kind of humility, respect, maybe. But now, Moses, this is how he did it. Jesus did it. Abraham did it. Joshua did it. But you don't do it. So you have your own idea about worship. Could we, uh, it's running out of time, brothers. Could we have, uh, as we are standing here now, as we are standing here now, could you put a question? I will include you, sir. Could we end there a question per person? Right? Could you speak into the microphone? Otherwise, they can't hear you. I believe that Mr. Dirad is well schooled, like the previous gentleman said. And understand that he has a great intellect. Right now, is that the question? No, not yet. Oh. But well, I would have said yes. I you. admire him for his courage as well as his knowledge. But there's one thing I I'm quite disappointed about, Mr. Didat. Could you could you put him a question, please? Yeah. It, no. let, it let boils me, down let, to that. Let me explain this one might solve the other people's problem. Yeah, yeah. Some people even of the Muslims feel that I'm unfair, I stop you. But let me put it to you this way. If you want to have a lecture to the people, call them together and say it. This man has called the people, we ask, could you ask a point which is ticklish, let him wriggle out of it and explain to the audience or get caught. But please do not give another lecture. No, I'm not something. giving a lecture. I'm, this, this is leading up to the lecture. I'm, I didn't prepare lecture. myself to, to, to get the man down as such. All right, my question is that I want to know how Mr. Didat interpret understands and interpolates all kind of context of the Bible. For instance, Jesus uh, in the book of um, John says, uh, the Father and I, or I and the Father are one. How does he explain that? Because if I am Mr. Jonathan as I am, I can't be my father and I cannot make a statement claiming to be that my father is me. Mr. Either. Jonathan, uh, if that is your name, could I say, you must have listened attentively because you are interested, but so was I. I'm open to correction, but I think Mr. Dean had explained that the very truth is when he says, me and my father are one. Am I right, brothers? Um, did he not explain that? Mr. Or did he? Mr. Chairman? No, all the, no, I'll answer this the question then. Thank you very much. As, uh, so that's Mr. The Chairman, question. just allow me to. You see, um, like this gentleman that was here before me, Mr. Didat was interpolating things, like for instance, he but read now, something but in... But now, Ola, you've asked the question, you can answer, you can also understand the question. Okay. I can, sure. Thank you. I did explain, I think, that this oneness that Jesus was talking about was in its context, verses 28, 29, 30. That is the context. That no man can pluck them out of my hand, 28. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand, verse 29. I and my father are one. That is the context. And I feel that any reasonable person could see that. But, since the Christian has an idea that this oneness implies, you know, getting into a sausage, like one sausage, one piece, like uh, God Almighty told Adam and Eve, that they twin shall be one flesh. Like a sausage. They were not. They were still two separate persons. Now, this same John, the one that we have quoted, John chapter 10, verse 30. In John chapter 17, verse 20 to 22, he explains what oneness is. He says, 
that they all may be one, O any one, all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, who, the disciples, among them, the traitor, Judas, among them, Peter, who cursed, abused, and swore him, among them, the ten, who left him in the lurch when he was most in need, all these, the Father, the Son, and all these twelve, may be one, that they all may be, also may be one in us, I in them, and thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one. I'm only quoting the same John. So in other words, all the twelve disciples and Jesus and God made into one sausage. Is that what that oneness implies? All, you know, putting through a mincer and taking them out as a one sausage. What is this oneness? It is a oneness in purpose. You see, the same oneness that Je as I explained in John 10, 30, same oneness, Peter and uh, Judas and the doubting Thomas, everybody, all with one with God, one person, so I in you and you in me and they in us. What is this? Sausage. So if you understand it like a sausage, then I know I have no answer. But I says, no, this is not that one sausage business is talking about. It's talking about they all are one in purpose to do the will and plan of God. That oneness. There is no other oneness. He's one with God, meaning whatever God wants him to do, he's doing. He's vibrating on the same wavelength as God. That is oneness. Not he becomes God or God becomes man, Jesus. Thank you. Next question, please. Mr. Didat, I would like to ask you this. <clears throat> I think this is my second time. Into, into. Can I just bring it down? That Come closer to the microphone. Okay. I would like you have given us a definition of Allah and John chapter 1, the word God, the three, the various words. I would like to ask you the question tonight is that how can you separate deity from deity? When the Bible says that in the beginning God, which means, you never mention this word tonight, you mention ally, you mention Allah, you mention the Greek words for God in the Greek word, but you never mention Elohim. When it is in a plural form, with a masculine ending, can you just explain to, for, to me, how do you divorce deity from deity? Thank you. Uh, the problem is that the Westerner, is reading an Eastern book. The Bible is an Eastern book, full of metaphors and similes. And the very first people who came in touch with this book were the Greeks and the Romans. Now the Greeks and the Romans, they had their man gods beyond counting. You know them, Jupiter, the god of heaven, Pluto, the god of hell, Vulcan, the god of fire, Neptune, the god of the sea, Mars, the god of war, and Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children. This was Greek mythology. But among such a people goes a new religion, new idea about a new son of God born in Palestine, Jesus Christ. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became literal to the Greek. And they became the pioneers of that message to your forefathers, to the Westerner as well as to you. You know, Indians, Coloreds, Africans, all. The white man, he inherited from the Greeks and the Romans and in turn, he gave that theology to you. Now, Im Elohim, if I went on to explain, El means God in Hebrew, Ela means God in Hebrew, Elohim also means God in Hebrew. And you say it's plural, and that's very correct. It is very correct that it is in the plural. But you see, the Hebrews, as well as the Arabs, both are Semites, Semitic languages, and they both have two types of plurals in their language. There is a plural of respect, and there's a plural of numbers. In every Eastern language, including my own, we have two types of plurals. Plural of numbers and plural of respect. So this im, you ask the Jew, is his book. He says, when you say hello im, are you thinking of Jehovah, Moses, and who else? He says, no, no, no. It's only God. But he so said, who is this Im? So he said, no, it's a plural of respect. Come to the Quran, same. In the Quran we read, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us, as to send down the revelation, and it is for us, 
to protect it. Now, who is this us? Us the Muslims. Muhammad, Holy Ghost, Jibreel, and Allah. He says, no. Who is this us? It's Allah. But he said, why is this us? He said, this is a plural of respect. And no Arab Christian has ever asked a Muslim in this 1,400 years, who is this us in the Quran? When the Quran says, Qul hu wallahu ahad, say, he is God the one and only. And yet he says, inna, inna, we have created the heavens and the earth, and we have done this, and we, who is this we? He said, no, this we is a plural of respect in our language. This is a plural of respect in Hebrew. John, next question, please. Um, I did that. My question that I want to put to you, I have noticed that you so fair to the Hebrews, to the Jews actually, and the Jews is just as ignorant as Mr. Ahmadidat. <laughs> this is my scripture. For unto us, listen, Mr. Ahmadidat, John, what do you say to this? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now this prophet Isaiah, you know the prophet Isaiah, and this one that he talk about is Jesus. Now why did he use the word, and he shall be called the Almighty God? Thank you. And he shall be called the Almighty God. I want to know who called him the Almighty God. You have 27 books in the New Testament. In the 27 books, who called him, Jesus, the Almighty God? Yeah, let, let John. Isaiah, the prophet, which I said, you have said. He shall be called. Yeah. Right. This was written 600 years before Jesus was born. Yeah. Right. So, when you say he shall be called, then somebody must call him so. Mm -hmm. 27 Mr. books, in the 27 yeah. books of the New Testament, there is nowhere he is called the Almighty God, there is nowhere he is called Emmanuel. You see, Emmanuel means God with us. Now this is a quality of a person, and that quality of a person when he displays, like Eli, Eli means my God. You I know this? I talk about the Old Testament. Yes, yes, I'm talking about the Old Testament, Eli in the Old Testament, in the first book of Genesis, 60 times the word Eli is used. Yeah. Eli means my God. You said that. Eli means my God. Is the name of a priest. Eli is the name Eli, of a priest. Not Eli. 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 All right. You, you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, you see now you pronouncing like a, a European. Yeah. I'm pronouncing like a Jew because because I'm nearer to the Jew. I'm nearer to the Jew in my language, Arabic and Hebrew. A sister languages, so I say Eli. You say Eli. I said, okay, Eli. That, that's why I said you're just as ignorant as a Hebrew. Right. Next question, please. <laughs> right. Next question. Mr. Didat, in your booklet that was distributed tonight, the the Lord, please. sorry that is relevant to the topic. To the lecture, to the lecture. Yes, oh yes, very much so. That was written for the very reason, as you can see in the introduction, to Correct. show that Jesus is not God. Am I not right? Now, you state there that um, Jesus cannot, can, cannot be called God because he is a racial God. He was a tribal Jew. Oh, May I brother, please read the context? He did not say that in his lecture. I, I, I insist. I'm sorry. That is no. Relevant. I'm sorry too. I, I'm I asked about his lecture. This topic. No, I asked about his lecture. Please, can I? Can did I? Appeal? Did he mention that in his lecture tonight? Can I appeal that? You can. You can see that separately. I asked. Did he, did he mention that in his lecture tonight? Did he? Look, Mr. Did Didat, he mention it in his lecture tonight? Did Mr. Didat prepare his lecture before tonight or not? No, I said, did he mention it in his lecture tonight? He did not. Did he Could prepare, I have the next question, sorry, please? Did he prepare his no, lecture I'm before sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, next question, please. You did I, not obey. I'm not going to give you a question. I can't I've really said pertaining that. to the lecture what he said tonight. Thank you. The next question, please. John, I'm not going to allow another question. Eh? I'm sorry. I thought it was John. Next question, please. I'm sorry. Next question, please. Sorry. Can, can I please appeal to it? To Mr. Didat, no, I, I, I will tell Mr. Didat also to sit still because I'm in the chair here. The next question, please, because you seem to want to work up the emotions. Concerning Jesus being called the Son of God and the scriptures that you went through this evening, 
tons of sons. Uh, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 60, and I appreciate you knowing our scripture, uh, verse 60 and following, uh, they, that's Jesus standing before the, the council in his judgment. They asked him if he was the son of God, and he said, you say that I am. And then they asked him further, and he says, in essence, in, the, in his language, yes, I am. Then the high priest began to tear his clothing and accuse him of blasphemy and say, what further witness do we need? So didn't he take his claim at that point to be the son of God as something more than just saying, I'm one like everybody else because of the reaction of the high priest? If you remember that trial, that midnight trial, you're referring to, before the trial, the chairman of the Sanhedrin, he had already passed a verdict. And the verdict was, it is expedient that one man die for the nation. So they were intent by hook or by crook to do away with the man. Because this man was a danger. You see, just about 24 hours before he had marched on to Jerusalem, he had ex upset the money changers' tables. He had whipped the people in the temple. Now, this young man, if things go out of hand, there will be a danger. So he said, it is expedient, not it is right or wrong, it is good or bad. It is expedient that this one man should be put away. So they had that midnight trial, and you read the trial. They brought false witnesses against him. One after another, and they couldn't tell in the evidence, if you remember. They couldn't tell in the evidence. So Jesus sees the fast that this trial was. So he says, I speak openly to the world. I ever thought in the temple and in the synagogue whether the Jews always gather and in secret have I said nothing. In other words, I would never say anything in secret which I was not prepared to say in public. No secret doctrines with him. So you can bring hundreds of witnesses to testify. Why is it that you are getting false witnesses and even false witnesses can't tell you? Now, the argument he put forth was so potent. They had no witnesses. So the officer standing by slapped him in the face to shut him up, the third degree. You remember? So Jesus says, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? What are you hitting me for? Right. So you can see from the word go, the whole thing is a farce. Hook or by crook, they want to condemn the man. An innocent expression like son of God. Look, Jesus is telling you in John chapter 10, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Look, this is son of God. I said, he's got them by the tents. But people are called gods. And you, in your language, you're not finding fault with that. In other words, look, this is the genius of our language. When we talk like that, we don't mean literally. You see? So now, since they were looking for trouble, he said, art thou the son of God? Means a righteous man. You remember on the cross when he cried out? The centurion, what did he say? He said, here is the son of God. The other gospel writer says, what did he say? He said, this is, the son of, uh, this is the son of God. The other one says, this is a righteous man. So righteous man and son of God are used synonymously by two writers of the, of the New Testament. The same expression, one says he is the son of God, and this same man is supposed to have said he is a righteous man. So in other words, are you a righteous person? All the Jews, the rightful people, you know, the... The prophets are called gods and the sons of God. He are gods and all of you are the children of the Most High. In that sense, he says, I am. But now, since the guy was looking for trouble, he said, what proof do we need more? Because there was no way of convicting him any other way. So he starts performing. But you note what he did. As soon as the same people go to Pilate, they change the charge. Art thou the Christ, the son of the living God? He said, I am. I thought the Christ, he is the Christ. Son means a righteous person of the living God. He says, yes. But the same expression, Christ, when they told Pilate, he says, he's claiming to be Christ a king. Here, they said, he's claiming Christ a God. So, you can see on the very face of it, that this is hook or by crook. They want to do away with the man, because they didn't like him. This is it. Um, thank you for your answer. Uh, I'm not sure... I'm not going to say anything. I was thinking about saying something naughty, but I'm not going to do that. Thank you very right. much. Many thanks. Could I have the next question? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Didot, uh, I would like to express myself, you know, clearly that I, you know, glad to be here tonight, you know, to listen to you. 
And about what was going out, he said, I do agree that there are tons of sons of God. And that the Bible said that all those who have received him, they become sons of God. But according to the, uh, uh, what we are talking about is tonight, that I want to ask you that the Bible said that great is the mystery of the God made. That God is manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. See on angels preaching unto Gentiles, believe unto the world, and receive up into glory. Would like to explain me that scripture? This is our friend Paul talking, I take it. See, this is Paul. Look, when I ask the Christian, who are you following? Who is your master? You say Jesus. I say, what does Jesus say? Look, a learned man of the Jew comes to Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verse 29, I think. And he says, Master, what commandment is the first of all? Look, simple language they are talking. What commandment is the first of all? The most important thing in faith, what is it? And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. It means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Could you remain seated, please, brothers? We're going to end very soon, please. So he repeats word for word what was given by Moses 1300 years before, without the change of a dot. Why should a learned man of the Jew go to Jesus, he's described as a scribe, means a learned man, he goes to Jesus and respectfully says, Rabbi, in the Hebrew language, he's a rabbi, master, teacher, bishop. What commandment is the first of all? Why should a learned man go to another learned man and ask the simplest of question which any Jewish child could have answered 2000 years ago? It's a problem. You see, like you are a mathematician, you go to Einstein, the master mathematician, and you ask him what is 2 plus 2? Does it make sense? No. Unless he has gone off somewhere fundamentally in his calculations. So you're trying to draw his attention, say, wait a minute. Einstein, I respect you, you're a great man, but what is 2 plus 2, sir? Not that he doesn't know what is 2 plus 2. So this learned man asking Jesus, what command was the first of all? Why did he ask him in the first place? Number two, the reply that he gave. This was 1300 years old. Why did he repeat? Why didn't he say, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the real answer that he should have given according to Christendom. Christendom's answer of the first commandment is, if I asked any learned Christian, what is the first commandment? Oh, he can rattle it off. The first is, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But if I asked you, what is your first commandment? Not what is the first commandment, what is yours? You are puzzled. Anybody would be. You see, so what I mean is, the importance that you ought to give to the first commandment, what are you giving to? Because you, when you were born, if you were born a Christian, you were baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Am I right? If you are a Trinitarian. Christian, you are not born in the titles. No, no, are you a Trinitarian? You believe in No, those? no, I believe in one God. You are closer to us. I believe in one God. Right. That's why the Bible said, it's a great is the mystery of the God made. The God there is, is no mystery. Is. No, 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 we say there is no mystery. Is the, look, God says, in the Bible we are told, God is not the author of confusion. Right. So the confusion that you have, you know, look, among the whites of South Africa, there are 1,000 different sects and denominations. 1,000. Do you know that? There are 3,000 among the blacks of South Africa. 3,000 different sets and denominations. Who is the author of them? God? Is God the author? No, no, God is not the author. So, we said, look, there is no mystery. God Almighty from the very beginning, He said, I am God, the one and only God. He threw Moses, He said, Shama Israel, Adonai, Elohim, Adonai, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Muhammad says, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Say, He is God, the one and only. There is no mystery about it. The mystery is the creation of the church. If you are not a Trinitarian, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, whether you are born again or not born again, you are very close to us. You see, you have taken a step in the right direction towards Islam. Well, as I said, that I believe in one God. And as, the, as, as I quote, uh, quote, quote the scripture, that he said that God is manifest in the flesh. 
Now, then immediately you believe in three gods. You oh, see? No, I, no, I don't agree with that. You see, when you say he manifests in the flesh, meaning that God came down to earth, God incarnate. He is God incarnate. You believe that? No, that, incarnation too. that he came into flesh, that means God took human form. Exactly. You, he, he, that means he incarnated, not reincarnation. You see, reincarnation means you're going to die and your soul might go into a dog or a pig or into another human being. No, that is reincarnation. We are not talking about that. Incarnate means God taking human form. The Hindu says Rama, took, God took human form in Rama. They say God took human form in Krishna. The Christian says God took human form in Christ. So if you believe that God came down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, then the voice that was heard from heaven, whose voice was that? Was it God's? Because he's already come down, he's taken human form. He was in his mother's womb for nine months. Look, the Bible says so. When he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. Who was in his mother's womb? This God incarnate. God came down and he was living in his mother's womb for nine months. I am asking how did he pull the strings to run his universe from his mother's strength, from his mother's womb. Huh? And then helpless little creature like one, you and I, imagine. The Almighty God, is that the form he took? With all the filth and the muck, made his mother impure for 40 days? Is that the same God who came down to us from heaven? Please, my dear brother, you see, though you say God is one, in your mind you got three. Oh, I'm definitely sure I haven't got three in my mind, sir. But thank, thank you very much. Mr. Thank Mr. you. Brothers and sisters in Islam.